Well, I'm part of this church. Um, my name is Susanna Kosh. I'm a volunteer, part of the teaching team and help in uh, the community center. Um, we came here and I'm part of this house since 1996. And this was always my dream, to stand here Easter Sunday and to say, He's risen! <laughs> and all God's people say back, Amen. He's risen indeed! Where are you all? Let's try this again. He's risen! He's risen indeed. That's it, that's the spirit. Amen. You know, we celebrate a risen Savior and we believe in Him not just because we have uh, read about this in His book, but because we have experienced his transformation power in our lives, amen? We have been healed, delivered, set free, some of us plucked back into community. He has given us a living hope, overflowing life here and now. And he's given us a hope beyond the grave because of his death and his resurrection. And that's what we celebrate in the name of Jesus this morning, together with millions of people around the globe. That's fantastic, isn't it? John 3.16 says this. Do we have anything? Yeah? There we go. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son his only son, and this is why. So no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merrily to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. You know, too many people these days believe that Jesus came to put an appointing, accusing finger at us, that God is this faraway God in heaven who takes upon himself the right to judge us all, to watch us all, to find faults in our lives. Actually, many Christians also believe that, but really, truly, the Bible says God so loved the world, that's why he sent his son, not to bring chaos and not to bring division and not to bring condemnation, but to put the world, every single one, every single person's life right again. Isn't that good news? Yeah. And maybe you've come here this morning and you have heard this before, but because of things in your life, you sort of don't quite are at that point where you can believe this anymore. Maybe you have never heard the good news of the gospel and today is your first day. I'm just hoping and I'm praying that, you know, God is alive, Jesus is alive, and because of that, he's here right now. He is going around, he's touching people's hearts and people's minds, and my prayer is may he touch you this morning. May you come to a place where you understand he is risen indeed. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. He wants to put your life back together again. Amen. Amen. So let's start. Luke 24. Get your spices ready because you need to wave at me in a minute. It says that Jesus has risen. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices. This is the only interaction you will get. <laughs> They took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found a stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the man said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. See, while Jesus was walking on earth, we know he gathered disciples around him, 12 men and others followed as well. And there were also a couple of women. One of them's name was actually Susanna. I'm in the Bible. <laughs> Luke 8, same spelling. So some women followed Jesus along and these women were part of those women following Jesus. And so they watched him and they witnessed him, his teaching and how he interacted with people and how he dealt with people. And I wonder if they were um, sort of remembering back the words that he said. For example, in Matthew 20, he said, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flocked and crucified. 
On the third day, he will be raised to life. They must have talked about this and remembered this. They remembered that he said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He said in John 10, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down, and, uh, down when I want to, and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. And then they realized, you know, it was actually not Pilate that crucified him. It wasn't the religious leaders that crucified him. It wasn't the soldiers that crucified him. It wasn't the mocking flock that crucified him. He had laid down his life himself, and he took it up again because they didn't kill him at the cross. He handed over his spirit. When you were here Friday and Saturday, you have seen all the scene that he was voluntarily doing this. He said, if, if, it, if it's possible, let this put away from me, but not my will, your will be done. He did it all for love. I wonder if they were discussing this when they were uh, walking away from the tomb. How he touched the untouchable, how he went to the outcast of society, Maybe they remember the story of the blind man. Maybe they're saying to each other, remember when we, went, when we were walking past that blind man? The story of the blind man gets me every time, personally. I, I find it so beautiful how Jesus brings back dignity to this man. You know, this is why he came. This is why we celebrate his resurrection. He brought dignity back into our lives. This man was born blind, and people believed that if you were born blind, then there was sin in your life somehow. <laughs> Either you do it yourself or your parents, but there was something wrong with you. And I heard it say that the society then thought they had the right to spit in the face of a person like this. Or oh, you've done something wrong, that's all you deserve. You know, I find sometimes the enemy comes and he spits at us, doesn't he? You're a divorcee, that's all you deserve. You're a gambler, that's all you deserve. Your family has run away from you, that's all you deserve. You lost your job. You ruined your finances. Whatever it is, you know, he comes and he spits at us. You know, when you spit at someone, it's not to hurt the person physically, but it takes away dignity. I know because I spat at someone once. I know I look so innocent, right? <laughs> to my defense, I was only 12 years old. <laughs> and I was this boy um, in my in my school, he was 13, and he was madly in love with me. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> and I got these letters from him. Probably twice a week, I got a letter. Do you want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> yes, no, little square, please tick. <laughs> if no, then why? <laughs> As if I would write an essay. And um, he was madly in love, and then one day he had a plan. He had two of his mates, and they were chasing me at recess, as you do. <laughs> and they were holding me, and his intention was to kiss me. I know what was he thinking. Probably like, you know, like in the movies, when he is madly in love with her. And she doesn't want him. But he knows she really does. I just have to prove it to her. And so he grabs her, and he kisses her passionately. And she's like struggling at the beginning, but then because of this kiss, this kiss, <laughs> she embraces him, and she kisses him back. And she says, oh, I do love you. And then they ride off on their horse in the sunset. That's probably what he was thinking. And while his lips were coming closer, I thought, that's not going to happen. And so I spat at him. Yeah, but, you know, I saw the look in his face. He was devastated. He was shocked. He felt embarrassed in front of his dudes. And, you know, he all of a sudden realized she really doesn't love me. And I felt, ever since, I really feel sorry. Sorry, maybe. <laughs> no, I don't, but I'm sorry. That's what spitting does. Takes away your dignity. Makes you feel worth nothing. And, you know, Jesus got spat on too on the cross. And it says nowhere that he wiped it off. 
He took it right with him to the cross. People thought he was cursed too. Whoever hangs on the cross is cursed so we can spit on him. And he took it all the way there for us, replacing it to give us new life, new hope, dignity back. So when Jesus was walking past that blind man, um, it's interesting because the disciples started to discuss with him, so who, who has sinned here? Him or his family? And imagine you sitting there and, and, and hearing this, people discussing your fate yet again, as if it's not enough that I can't see, as if it's not enough that my family abandoned me, as if it's not enough that I'm so dependent on people giving me something, and often all I feel is the spit in my face, as if this is not enough, they're discussing my fate right in front of me. And so they asked Jesus, what do you think? Who sinned, his parents or him? And Jesus says, neither. And I wonder if the blind man goes, who, who, who said that? No one has ever said that to me. And Jesus says, neither. This is so that God may be glorified in his life. God glorified in my life, can this be? But you know, God wants to glorify himself in every single person's life on this planet. There's something that he's placed inside of you that he can call out and he'll be glorified through your life. And so then the blind man heard this cursed sound again. And his heart sings. But then gentle fingers touch his eyes. Jesus puts the mud on it. He says, go wash yourself. The blind man washes himself, and he is healed, and he can see. And because of that, you know, he has the right to go back into his family and into his society. Jesus restores the dignity of this man. And people come, and they see him, and they're astonished of what they see. They say, is this the blind man? And someone else says, nah, he just, he just looks like him. That's not him. And they go back and forth, and then the blind man says, it's me, ta-ta, it's me. And they're discussing back and forth, this cannot be, because for them, they know that only Jesus, only the Messiah can heal someone born blind, let alone on the Sabbath. This, this cannot be, and he says, I'm telling you, it is. How did this work? And the blind man, in the end, says, I don't know. All I know is one day I was blind, and now I see you know, when we give our life to Jesus, he can do something so extraordinary in our lives that people will come and say, what happened? And you know, salvation is a supernatural thing every single time, isn't it? How can we ever explain what he has done? People told me, you've been brainwashed. Hello, there was so much rubbish in there. In an hour service, this could have never happened. It's a supernatural thing. One day I was blind. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. I, I, I thought he's, he's far up there, he's judging me. One day I was blind. Jesus did something in me, and now I see. And you know, this has been 30 years ago, and I would not ever want to turn back. When we give our life to him, he restores our dignity to the point that people say, hey, what happened? I don't know. One day I was blind, now I see. Maybe they remembered this Jesus, and this is what we are celebrating this morning. The resurrected Christ does something extraordinary in a life that turns over to him, amen? Maybe they were remembering that. Maybe they will remember the story of this woman. The Bible just calls her a certain woman, an unknown woman. She didn't even have a name. What an identity is that? And not just that, it seems like she lived by herself, which is very hard in those times. And not just that, it says that she was suffering from a condition called a blood flow for 12 years. As if that's not hard enough, imagine the fatigue girls, you know, we know what we're talking about. Imagine the loneliness. And not just that, but because of that, she was called unclean. That means she was shunned from family, shunned from society, shunned from religious leaders, because whatever she would touch would be unclean as well. She might not have gotten many visitors because they risked the chair she sits on is unclean. If I sit on that chair, I'll be unclean as well. What a way of living. And then she hears stories about this Jesus. And she hears that he touches the untouchable. He heals the lepers. And not just that, she hears that the untouchable go and touch him and they get healed. And something starts to rise within her. You know, society told her, you're a woman, you're unclean, you're not allowed to go there, mix and mingle pe with people, let alone touch a man, let alone touch this holy man. 
You have to stay put, you have to stay at home. But because she's so desperate, you know, the Bible says she went from doctor to doctor to doctor to try to find a cure, and in the end, she got the final verdict. There is nothing we can do for you anymore. I wonder if you maybe have heard this word it say over yourself one day in your life, or maybe over a loved one. Your condition is incurable. There's nothing we can do for you anymore. We have heard this say over our son when he was 15 years old, and he's going to come and share with you in a minute what happened. The doctor said to us, his condition is incurable. This is it. He will have to live with this for the rest of his life. This woman was so desperate to find a cure. She did not want the doctors to have the final say. She wanted to have this Jesus, this healer, this Messiah to have the final say. And so she threw overboard every protocol that was in place. She said, no one is holding me back anymore. And you know, when we hear about Jesus, when we are in these positions, you know, nothing should hold us back anymore. No good meaning friends, no male meaning doctor, no one. When you hear about this Jesus, you just throw overboard normal protocol and you go and touch him. He's going to change your life. Life. This woman went out and she pushed through the crowd, love her energy, she pushed through the crowd, she went and she touched him. And this was remarkable because Jesus was actually on a very important mission. There was this um, synagogue legal leader who came, a very high position, and he wanted Jesus to come to his house because his daughter was sick. And so Jesus was on the way to this very important person, but this woman didn't care. You know, sometimes we think, oh, Jesus is just, you know, on a very important mission. He will not have time for me. You know, I can't disrupt him with my little things. She went and she touched him. And then it says that power went out from Jesus and she got healed. And Jesus stopped because he felt power coming out from him. And he turned around and he said, who touched me? And this woman went, and the Bible says she told him, told him all. The people were all, you can't stop, we're on a busy mission. And this woman told him all. Now you can imagine how long he had to listen, because when a woman tells you all, <laughs> it takes a while. He stops and he listens to all that she had to say. And then eventually he says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. You see the difference? from an unknown woman, a certain woman, to daughter. He completely changed her identity. You're not just someone, you're a daughter. You're a child of God. This is what he does. From nobody knows you, to being part of the family, to being a son of God and a daughter of God, getting a new identity. He calls us kings and priests, beloved children. And this word, your faith has healed you, is the word zozo. Very interesting word, because it actually says that she got saved out of destruction into divine safety. So it's not just that he heals us physically, can heal us physically, but he places us out of a place of destruction into divine safety. Hallelujah. They remembered that when they were talking together. You know, and you think, oh, well, that's a great story. That's way buried there somewhere in the Bible. But what about today? Can he do this today? Well, the Bible says that by his stripes, we are healed. How many of you have experienced that healing in your life? By his stripes, we are healed. He's the risen Savior, the living God. And I'm going to let my son David now share his testimony very quickly because we've experienced that in our life. life, the miracle that he did in my life, because I believe today can be a day where that happens for you. <clears throat> Maybe you need a miracle in your body, in your family, or in your relationship with God, but I want to encourage you to believe that today could be the day for you. Mm -hmm. And so as my mom said, when I was 15, I was, I was diagnosed with, a, with an incurable disease called arthritis. And it started at first where I had some, some pain in my feet and uh, I went to the, to the podiatrist, who's a foot doctor, and they checked and they said, you know, you just need to get some orthotics and then you'll be okay. And so I had some hope, was excited, and I got some things fitted for my feet. And after a few weeks, I was, I was feeling a bit better, but, but then the pain started to get worse. So we went back to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you need to go to the physio. The physio, you know, said, oh, you'll be okay within a few weeks. And I started to feel a bit better, but then I started to feel worse. And, and finally, I had to go to a specialist who, who right away 
knew what was wrong, we said get an MRI and I had some blood tests and I was diagnosed with arthritis, which if you don't know what it is, it's a sickness where your body starts attacking itself. So instead of healing itself, it starts attacking itself. And so at first I just had pain in my feet and, and some mornings I couldn't, I couldn't walk for mm -hmm. half an hour. I was in, in so much pain and I was put on some medication and I would get better and then I would get worse again. And I was on this constant cycle where I'd be a little bit better because of this heavier medication and then I'd be worse and I would need to be on heavier medication. And at first I had pain in my feet and then I had it in one knee and then in another knee and then in both my hands. And, and, and most days by, by seven in the, in the evening I had no more energy, I couldn't play sport anymore. Uh, uh, I couldn't play with my younger brother, he's, he's nine now so he was four or five, he wanted to play soccer with me and I couldn't, I couldn't play with him anymore and there was no hope because there's no cure for this disease. And at its worst point, uh, when I was 18, uh, I had to take over 100 pills every week and an injection every two weeks just to manage the pain. And as I said, there was no hope, it was just going to get worse and worse mm. and worse. And I'd been prayed for many times and had not seen a breakthrough in my life. I was at many healing meetings where I stood up and believed for God to heal me and, and nothing happened. But, but, but I kept persevering, kept, kept believing that eventually maybe I will have this miracle. And uh, uh, one day in, in June 2014, I was going on a missions trip to Mexico and we stopped over at a church in America. And uh, at this church, um, they decided to have a healing service again and I stood up at some point for healing and the people in front of me prayed for me for healing. And I don't know who they were, they went, you know, the man or woman of God who was on stage that day was just someone in front of me, prayed for me. And I didn't feel anything happen in my body. I expected, you know, maybe some, you know, to feel some <laughs> massive lightning bolt or something, I don't know, something to happen and I felt nothing. But I decided to see how I would feel the next day and I didn't feel worse the next day. So I waited another day, the next day I felt better. And within two weeks, I had no more pain in my body. I could walk normally, no more pain in my hands. I had all the energy again like I did before. And I went back to the doctor and he said, you know, this is, there's no way this really happened. You know, this, this, I don't believe something supernatural has happened. But if within three months you're better, maybe something supernatural has happened, but you're not. You're going to be worse off than you were before. And that was uh, over five years ago now, mm. and I'm completely, no more pain in my body, mm. completely healed. Praise God. By His stripes we are healed. We'll make some room at the end to pray for people. And please come forward if you have any need. You know, Jesus is not too busy even this Easter morning to stop for you. When Jesus stopped, someone summarized this beautiful. Have I got this for you? Yeah. Here we go. The whole crowd was quiet. Everybody straining to see who had brought the party to a screeching halt. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was entirely focused on one outcast, a little scrap of unknown humanity. Her loneliness and illness had put all of heaven in a rage. And God sent his Son for her alone at this moment. You know, our loneliness and our illness puts heaven in a rage, and he's going to stop every moment. We want to come and touch him. Jesus came so we would understand who he is. With every word, with every deed, with every miracle, with every story, that was his focus. So we would know who he is and why he came. Someone once said this like this. Jesus is the bread of life so that the bakers can understand. Jesus is the water of life so that the plumbers can understand. Jesus is the light of the world so that electricians can understand. Jesus is the cornerstone so that architects can understand. This one's good, apologize up front. Jesus is the truth so that politicians can understand. <laughs> He's the hidden treasure so that bankers can understand. He's the life so that biologists can understand. He's the great physicians so that doctors and nurses can understand. He's the good teachers so that educators can understand. He's the rock of ages so that geologists can understand. He's the righteous one so that judges can understand. He's the pearl of great prices so that jewelers and women can understand. <laughs> He's wisdom so that philosophers can understand. He's the good shepherd so that farmers can understand. 
He's the Alpha and the Omega, so that scientists can understand. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, so that everyone afraid of death can understand. Because the truth is, we might save ourselves from a broken heart. We might be able to wipe up the spit in our face. We might have coping me 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 mechanisms. Thank you. You're so engaged. We might be able to even bury our cross and bury this uh, sickness that we have. We might be able to do all that. But what we cannot save ourselves from is the effects of sin, and we cannot save ourselves from death. And death will come eventually. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have hope beyond the grave. We know where we're going to spend eternity. We know we're going to be with him. Jesus is the resurrection and the life so that no one afraid of death so that no one will be afraid of death. You know, when Jesus was crucified, there were two um, criminals crucified, one to the left and one to the right of him. And, uh, you know, Jesus, the Bible says, was not even recognizable anymore. He was so beaten, so tortured, that he was not not re recognizable anymore. When they put his body on the cross and they put the cross up, it went down with a thump, and it says that every bone went out of joint. You know, Jesus wasn't the picture of this nice, polished crucifixion that we see with just a little bit of blood running down. He was basically reduced to a piece of meat. Excuse the expression, but that's what it was. He was hanging there, limp and almost lifeless. And the two thieves next to him start a conversation that tells me that they have probably not been beaten and tortured like he had. They have probably not had to carry their cross five kilometers or how long it was like he had. They have probably not been gone through trial day after day after day like he had. They had not been going through the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane like he had. And so they start a conversation. One of them starts mocking Jesus, joins in with all the crowd, with the soldiers, and says to him, well, if you, the great Messiah, save yourself, and while you're at it, save us as well. He starts mocking, I don't know why, maybe he thought if he joins in with the crowd, they let him off the hook. The other one was different. He said to the one who was mocking, stop it. What we get, we deserved. This man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you are in your kingdom. And suddenly, the life left body of Jesus moves. And suddenly, he lifts his head and through bloodshot eyes, the love of God shines. And he says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. You know what that shows me? That God in his weakest moment has time for the weakest cry of the worst sinner. Today you will be with me. And you know what those two words with me summarize the whole gospel story. Those two words with me is what it is all about. Those two words with me is why he came and did it all for love. Those two words show us, you know, what happened in the first garden and happened in the second garden was also you could be with me. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Why all of it? So you could be with me. With me, that was his purpose. So we could be with him. And you are here this morning, maybe, and you say, well, that's exactly my problem. Because I was actually like one of those ones on the cross. I was joining in with the mocking. I didn't believe. I didn't want to have anything to do with this Jesus. Is there any hope for me? I once was walking with him, but things happened, and I just left. I didn't want to have anything to do. I spat on him. Is there any chance for me? I want to finish off by telling you a story. And this story is one of my favorites, and I've told it here before, but I'm going to tell it again because I know there are some people who haven't heard it. That this story so beautifully shows us the love of the Father. It's a story that Jesus told, and I have heard this tell someone else, and, and he adopted it a bit, and I adopted it again, so here we go. You ready? It's the story of the Father and his Son. 
and they're living together on a farm. And when you hear the story, you tell that they have a beautiful relationship. Already as a really young boy, the boy would follow his father wherever he would go in the farm, and the father in his love would train the boy in everything to do with farming. He knew which egg was good, he knew when to milk the cows, he knew when the time was ripe to bring in the corn. He learned everything from his, he adored his father. His father was the greatest, his father was the strongest, his father was the most handsome father. He loved him, and you can tell also that they must have been quite rich. There was the talk of servants and everything. And so every day, father and son would go out in the farm and do their work. Every night, they would come together, have dinner, and talk, and, and have fellowship with each other. And life was great, great relationship. And then over time, the son grew up. He was a teenager now. And people from the city would come to the farm because they wanted to buy organic products, as you do. And the son would always stand a little bit around the corner and listen in to the conversation of those people and his dad. And he would see the cars they're coming with and the watches they would wear and the clothes they would wear and the talk they had about this great life in the city and the parties they had and the friends they had and the girls they had. And the more he heard it, the more he looked around. And all he could hear was meh, meh, moo, moo, stinking, smelling, farm life. And the more he heard these stories, the more discontent he got. It's really boring here on the farm. I mean, they, they have great stories to tell. And he also got a little bit suspicious with, with his father. Why did he never tell me about this life in the city? Why didn't he never tell me that there's something else out there? Is he really good? Or does he withhold something from me? And he mistrusted his father. And his father could see that something was coming. And the son then made a decision. When I'm 18, I'm going to be out of here. And sure enough, on his 18th birthday, he went into the lounge where his father was sitting near the fireplace. And he said, Dad, I've got something to tell you. I'm 18 now. I'm going to be out of here. I want you to pay me my inheritance now. <sighs> You know, Jesus told this to Jewish listeners, and they must have gasped, because honoring father and mother was such a deep thing, which it should be, right? They must have been shocked to hear this. Every father would have said, this is it, I'm not going to have anything to do with this boy anymore, because what did he say, in other words, I can't even wait till you are dead, I want my money now. But the father saw that the son has made up his mind. And he respected that. And he gave him his money and the son left through the door and the father was standing in the door frame and said to the son, son, there's just one more thing I need you to know. And the son was like, what? He didn't even turn around. And the father said, I just want you to know that the door will always be open for you. You're always welcome home. And the son was just, whatever. And off he went, and he went into the, the city, and he discovered that everything those people were saying was true. He got the car, he got the watch, he got the clothes, he got the party, he got the girls, he got the friends, surprise, surprise. But he wasn't very wise with his money, and quite quickly he ran out, and with his money running out, his friends were running away, surprise, surprise. And he only had a few dollars left, and on top of that, the land was hit with a recession, so he needed to find work, which should be easy, right? I mean, there were lots of farms around. He was an expert in farms. Surely someone would offer him a job, but nobody did. It always surprised me when I read this. Nobody did. I wonder why. I wonder if maybe the reputation of him traveled beforehand. Don't give this lad another chance. He betrayed his father. He will betray you. He does not deserve a second chance. And then one farmer had a little bit of pity on him, and he said, Come in, Jewish boy. You can feed my pigs. It was such a disgrace. Pigs were utterly unclean in those days. You can feed my pigs. I don't pay you anything. You can eat with them and you can sleep with them. And here he was sitting at his lowest point. And suddenly the voice of the father came back. You are always welcomed home. And he thought, could this be true? Could he have really meant it? After all that I've done, after the disgrace, after running away, after mocking him, after... Could it be? And he thought he's going to give it a shot. And he decided to write a letter to his father first. He said, Father, I, 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 wanna, I wonder if this is still true. I'm going to come home with this and this train, you know, and the train would actually bypass the farm. 
So the farm is a little bit on a hill, there's a big tree in front of it. And the son wrote, as a sign that you would welcome me back home, would you please hang a white tissue in the tree? So when I drive past in the train and I see that tissue, I know I'm welcomed home again. And he posted the letter and a few days later hopped on the train and he was so nervous. He was run down, he stank, he was dirty, and another man hopped on the train. And he realized that there was something wrong with this young man. He said, what's up? And the young man poured out all his heart to this other man. And the other man said, I know what you're talking about. I know that farm. I drive past it every day on my way to work. I know it's up on the hill, and I know that big tree. Well, we, you're going to find out any minute. And with that, the young man grew really nervous. And he said, could you do me a favor? I can't stand looking out of the window. I don't know what happens if I don't see a white tissue in the tree. Could you look for me? And the other man said, sure, sure I can. And so he, the young man buried his face in his hands and the other man opened the window and looked outside. And after a while he said, I can see the farm and I can see the tree. quiet for quite a long time and the young man said you're making me nervous man what's going on there is no tissue in the tree right and the other man said no there is not one tissue in the tree the whole tree is covered with white tissues he said there must be thousands of them I don't even see any more leaves and he said and there's a man running down from the farm and he's waving a big white flag welcome home son welcome home son you're welcome home son and when the tree when the train came into the station the young man hopped off and all the other men could see father and son hugging each other the worship team can come up now. Why is Jesus doing this? Why is he telling these stories? Because he wants every single person on this planet to know the door will always be open. You're always welcome home. We're going to have the worship team sing a song over us in a moment where these lyrics are actually in there. Nothing that you can do can make him close the door and nothing you have done will make him close the door. Because of his great love, he gave his only son. Everything was done so you would come. Let's pray together. Let's close our eyes. Father God, we thank you for this love, Lord, displayed yet again on this beautiful Easter Sunday. We thank you for your resurrection power that transformed so many people. And Lord, you're still in the business of transforming lives, of bringing people home, of restoring people's dignity and identity. I thank you, Father, that you're here right now, right this very moment, your life, and we know that therefore you are here.